Good morning, everyone. Please turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy and chapter 3. And I'm going to read verses 16 and 17 for us. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3 and starting at verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Friends, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that your word is living and active and trustworthy and sufficient, uh, just as you are living and active and trustworthy and sufficient. And we ask that by your grace, uh, through your spirit, that none of us here would leave this place unchanged by your word this morning. This we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Friends, are there uh, parts of scripture that you wish just weren't there? Uh, verses that you find really hard to believe? Uh, passages that challenge bad habits? that confront you and your status quo and make you super uncomfortable. Back in 1803, the third president of the United States, a guy called Thomas Jefferson, took some time out of his busy schedule to finish off a project that had been on his to-do list for quite some time. Uh, a cut and paste job on the Bible, the Gospels in particular, quite literally a cut and paste job as it turns out, cutting out bits of the Jesus story that he didn't like, that he found really hard to believe, that he wished weren't there, and rearranging and repackaging the rest. He introduced it like this. I've made a wee little book from the Gospels, which I call the philosophy of Jesus, by cutting the text out of the book and arranging them on the pages of a blank book in a certain order of time or subject. In other words, he wanted to impose some content, not to mention some chronological discipline on what he perceived to be these unruly, unruly gospels. He goes on, a more beautiful or precious morsel of ethics I've never seen. It's a document in proof that I am a real Christian. That is to say, a disciple of the doctrines of Jesus. And by doctrines, he means the stuff that he reckons Jesus really said and really did. The Sermon on the Mount, for example. Not the supernatural add-ons supplied by Jesus' star-struck followers in his thinking. And so Jesus' miracles don't make the cut in Jefferson's Bible. Jesus' resurrection doesn't either. Jesus dies, and that's the end of the story. Jefferson's Bible, it ends on a bit of a downer, it has to be said. Quote, there they laid Jesus and rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulchre and departed. The end. That's it. The Jesus' dual nature falls off the table as well, quite literally in this case, I'm imagining, given the nature of Jefferson's craft time. That Jesus was human... But he's merely human, as far as Jefferson's concerned. To the corruptions of Christianity, he wrote, I'm indeed opposed, but not to the genuine precepts of Jesus himself. I am a Christian in the only sense in which he wished anyone to be, sincerely attached to his doctrines in preference to all others, ascribing to himself every human excellence and believing he never claimed any other. One verse that definitely didn't make the cut, so to speak, in Jefferson's Bible was our passage this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is God-breathed, or as we'll see, perhaps better, breathed out by God. Three words in Greek, the original language the Bible's written in, three words loaded with theological freight. Starting with the first of these, all scripture. As Christians, ours is a literary religion. In the garden, our parents uh, first saw God. If we lived 2,000 years ago in Palestine, we might have seen God incarnate. 
In the new heavens and the new earth, we'll see God. But by and large, throughout salvation history, we encounter God through his word. All scripture. And by scripture, Paul's primarily, but not exclusively, got in mind the Old Testament. This word, grafair, it comes up over 50 times in the New Testament. And the vast majority of references are referring back to the Old Testament. But not just the Old Testament. There are a few places in what we we now call the New Testament where the human authors let on that the canon isn't yet closed, at least not then, that God wasn't done speaking through his word. A few hints of these. So, for example, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18, where Paul says, For the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Clearly a reference to Deuteronomy 25. But then the verse goes on, and the laborer deserves his wages. And the remarkable thing is about that se- the second half of that verse is that this interpretation of Deuteronomy, the laborer deserves his wages, actually comes from Luke's gospel. They're Jesus' words recorded by Luke, where Jesus applies the Old Testament for us. And remarkably, Paul is describing Luke's words, Jesus' words, as scripture. Now, for those with ears to hear, this subtle recognition embedded within Luke's gospel that the Old Testament doesn't have a monopoly on this word scripture. We see another example in 2 Peter chapter 3, where Peter writes in verse 16, describing Paul's letters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. Those last words being operative, the other scriptures. Even at this early stage, Peter being willing to baptise Paul's letters with the word scripture. And in the process, alerting us to the way the early church saw Paul's letters as uniquely authoritative, on par with the Old Testament. Now, not that everything that Paul wrote was inspired uh, by God, though. If he wrote to-do lists, supposing he did for argument's sake, or if he wrote shopping lists, it's not as though they were God-breathed per se. In other words, notice the focus isn't so much on the human author being inspired. It's all scripture that's God-breathed. And not simply uh, that they're inspired by God either, as much as they are breathed out by God. That seems to be the gist of the word that Paul is using here. It's an unusual word, a unique word even, possibly a word that Paul has made up for the occasion. This word, it doesn't crop up anywhere else in the Bible, let alone in any other contemporary literature. These scriptures, they are breathed out, spirated by God. It's Paul's way of stressing the Bible's divine source. Just as God breathed life into Adam in Genesis 2, he breathes out his word. And their divine origin is precisely the reason they're so powerful and authoritative. The words he breathes out, they carry authority. Divine author, divine authority. And not just some scripture, notice. It's all of it. It's all of it we read in our passage this morning. The third of these three loaded words that Paul uses, all scripture is breathed out by God. For us living on this side of Jesus' uh, uh, first coming, not one testament, but both. Not just red letters, but black letters as well. Not just the verses that we like, but all of the verses. And because scripture is breathed out by God, all of it, all of it is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. All of it's God's gift for showing us the way to God and the way of godliness. And so we might say to Thomas Jefferson, Mr. President, drop the scissors, step away from the Bible. All scripture is breathed out by God. Friends, you know, it's tempting to be quite critical of someone like Thomas Jefferson at this point, isn't it? 
Uh, He's claiming to be a real Christian after all, but his convictions about God, about God's word, they're they're so clearly those of a a deist, someone who believes that God is is remote, uh, not really involved with day-to-day life. It's tempting to look down on his view of the Bible. You know, some scripture is God-breathed and useful, is in effect what he's saying. And I'll be the one who decides what parts and uh, are useful and what parts aren't useful uh, for us. Thanks very much. Now, as evangelicals, it's tempting to stand in sure-footed judgment. After all, aren't we the theological descendants of the Reformation? Isn't sola scriptura our rallying cry? Scripture alone, the Bible alone, as our authority. When it comes to Jefferson's view of Scripture, it's tempting to think that we've got our act together. And yet, and yet, and for those conditioned to expect a homiletical plot twist uh, in the sermon, uh, here it comes. Here's the thing, and this is the bit where history bites, that Jefferson's wasn't the only cut-and-paste Bible that was published during the first decade of the 19th century. Fun fact, just five years later, in 1808, another skinny Bible appeared. This one, a little more expansive than Jefferson's, to be sure, but still very selective. What was it called? It was called Parts of the Holy Bible Selected for the Use of the Negro Slaves in the British West India Islands. Or, as it's most commonly called today, the Slave Bible. Only three copies remain today. Visit the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., and there's an exhibit devoted entirely to it. Who, you ask, is responsible for the Slave Bible? Was it a deist like the sitting president at the time? Nope. Was it a theological liberal? Nope. Wasn't a theological liberal either. Who then? Who was responsible for the Slave Bible? Of all people... It was mission-minded evangelicals, members of a brand new mission agency called the Society for the Conversion and Religious Instruction and Education of Negro Slaves. The founder was the Bishop of London, a guy called Bealby Porteous, an evangelical no less. And not all uh, bishops at the time were, were friendly to the gospel, let alone to mission, but it seems like Bishop Porteous was soundly converted He was good friends with abolitionists like William Wilberforce, who we heard just briefly about yesterday. Uh, He was an evangelical, not just committed to evangelism, but committed to seeing the gospel transform society. Now, from everything we know, Porteous was sincerely invested in the plight of these slaves. And so he commissioned a bunch of short-term missionaries to visit plantations in the Caribbean, the aim being to put the word of God into the hands of of slaves, or at least some of the Bible, into the hands of slaves. Ask Porteous if he believes 2 Timothy 3.16, is all scripture breathed out by God? I suspect he would have said, yeah, of course it is. And yet the Bibles they took with them uh, down to the Caribbean, uh, they they were slimline editions, we might say. Whole books of the Bible were disappeared, and where books remained, they were often drastically pared down. It was the truth, it just wasn't the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Prepare a short form of public prayers for them, instructed the bishop, together with select portions of scripture, particularly those which relate to the duties of slaves toward their masters. And so these evangelical missionaries had two goals. First, Pray that uh, these slaves would read and be saved, but second, that these slaves would read and continue obeying their British masters. The last thing slave owners wanted was a repeat of the slave uprising that happened in Haiti just a few years before. Sure, come and do your evangelism thing, folks, but make sure you bring down sanitised Bibles first. And so you can just imagine the redactions that took place. Any passage, any book that described God as a liberating God, it had to go. It didn't make the cut. 
And so the slave Bible goes from Genesis 45 and Joseph making the best of his enslaved situation and skips right through to Exodus chapter 19. The Ten Commandments in chapter 20, they stay, but Israel's escape from Pharaoh's clutches, it gets cut. And then a chapter on, we come to Exodus 21, and verse 16 has to go. Whoever steals a man and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him, shall be put to death. Of course, that verse had to go. We come over to the New Testament. Uh, Galatians chapter 3 is there, just not verse 28. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. That verse... Not there. First Timothy, First Timothy is there, just, just not all of it. Especially the way Paul says the law isn't laid down for uh, the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for, among a whole host, enslavers. All scripture might be God-breathed in theory, but only some of it, it seems, is profitable in Jamaica Circa 1808. Other verses get the nod. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. Slaves, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. That definitely stays. So does Ephesians 6, 5. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Amazingly, given all the verses that got culled, whole books of the Bible... Can you guess one of the verses that did remain without a hint of irony? 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is breathed out by God. Jefferson's Bible. The slave Bible. Different redactors, different motives. Both of them wielded scissors. And when it comes to the former, the temptation is to look on from a comfortable distance, isn't it? No, Jefferson's a deist. Of course he'd treat the Bible like that. His theology permits, even encourages, these kind of abuses. But the latter, it's much closer to home, isn't it? It's our home. These short-term missionaries, they're, they're part of our tribe. These Caribbean cruisers, they're nothing if, if not hardcore Scripture Union beach missions, 19th century style. In lots of ways, these evangelicals would have slotted right into Narrabri, We War, Anglican. A seamless fit. And it begs the question, when it comes to our passage this morning, 2 Timothy 3.16, what can we learn from those who've gone before us? Maybe one thing we can learn at the very least is that it's one thing to preach sola scriptura. It's one thing to say amen to sola scriptura, that we believe that the Bible is our ultimate authority. It's one thing to talk the talk of all scripture being breathed out by God, but surely it's another thing to walk it. Saying sola scriptura is easy. Living it is hard. We mightn't be so crass, physically cutting bits out of the Bible, deliberately omitting bits that we don't like, parts we don't think will go down well with those we're speaking with. But surely, if we're honest with ourselves, We're not so very different from them, are we? Their temptation is our temptation. So friends, I wonder if there's a Bishop Bealby Porteous lurking inside each and every one of us today. That apart from God's kindness, you and I are on that boat to the West Indies as well. Armed with missionary zeal, to be sure, but bringing a beleaguered Bible to a beleaguered people. I wonder if there isn't a Thomas Jefferson lurking inside each and every one of us as well, presenting a selective Jesus, a more palatable Jesus to a world that uh, wants nothing to do with him. Well, friends, God's word for us this morning is this, that all scripture is breathed out by God. And it's useful no matter what season of life we might find ourselves in This morning, all scripture is breathed out by God. Friends, what season of life do you find yourself in this morning? Maybe with all of the upheaval 
that's happened over the last couple of years, even with that in mind, all things considered, at the moment, things are going all right. You're sailing along in life. Can't get enough of Zoom. God's blessed you with a job that's uh, pandemic-proof. Uh, or you've been blessed with a new one, perhaps. There's a gentle breeze behind you, blue sky above, calm waters below. Friends, if this is you, remember, all Scripture is breathed out by God. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1. For everything, there's a season. Or maybe for you this morning, life's less plain sailing and more high seas and gale force winds. Economically, psychologically, spiritually, you're just being tossed to and fro. You're wondering if the next wave is the one that's going to overwhelm you, send you to the bottom. Friends, remember, all scripture is breathed out by God. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1. For everything, there's a season. And Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Well, friends, maybe this morning you're struggling with a besetting sin, a sin that you just can't shake, and you keep on doing what you don't want to do. And you're wondering if God's willing or able to forgive you yet again for the umpteenth time. Maybe you're tempted to think, surely I've exhausted God's willingness, his ability to forgive me. Friends, remember, all scripture is breathed out by God. As we heard earlier today, Psalm 103, verse 8, the Lord is compassionate and gracious slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Or Galatians 2.16, we know that a person isn't justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Or maybe that isn't you. Maybe for you, to all intents and purposes, you've given up struggling with a particular sin. You've stopped hating your sin as much as you once used to. That's just who I am. It's just who I'll ever be. And you've started to presume on God's forgiveness. You've started to settle for cheap grace, as Bonhoeffer described it. Friends, remember, all scripture is breathed out by God. James 2.14, what good is it if someone says he has faith but doesn't have works? Can that faith save him? Or when it comes to growing in holiness, maybe you're tempted to just let go and let God. If God wants me to grow in righteousness, it'll just happen, right? Friends, remember that all scripture is breathed out by God. Philippians 2.12, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Or maybe you're tempted in the other direction, less let go and let God and more God is my co-pilot. As though when it comes to growing as a Christian, God's sitting in the passenger seat. He's just along for the ride. Friends, remember, all scripture is breathed out by God. Philippians 2, 13, the very next verse. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Or maybe you've been recently knocked for six financially. Maybe you've lost work, you're looking for some but can't find any, or not enough of it at any rate. Friends, remember, all scripture is God-breathed. Matthew 6, verse 31, don't be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Or maybe you're pretty comfortable at the moment. You've got a job, you're spending less, saving more. Friends, what an opportunity to be generous. Friends, remember, all scripture is breathed out by God. Galatians 6.2, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. <laughs> 
Friends, I don't know your particular circumstances this morning, but God does. And one thing I do know is this, that all scripture is breathed out by God. In these unsettling times, what a comfort it is to know this and to embrace this and cherish this and live this out. Friends, where else have we to go when God alone has the words of eternal life? Let's spend some time praying, shall we? Now, dear Father, you've said to us in your word, we have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, that we would do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place. Father, as we leave this place now, give us an insatiable appetite for your word, for all scripture, that we would continually taste and see that you are good. It's in Jesus' name and for his sake that we pray. Amen.